Thank you. Uh, so as, as was said, my name is Kendall Clement, and we say this uh, AMP UMI. Basically, we're going to be talking about designing analysis of unique molecular identifiers and deep lamp con sequencing. Uh, so I want to start out with just a, oh, sorry. There we go. I'm going to start out with just a brief overview of what unique molecular identifiers are. I'm going to be referring to these as UMIs and how they can help us overcome PCR amplification bias. Next, in designing uh, or in using UMIs, you may have two questions. First of all, how do I choose the correct UMI length? I'm going to address this question. And next, what happens to my experiment and what happens to my interpretation if I use the wrong UMI length? And then finally, I'll wrap up with an introduction to our tool called AMP UMI, which is used for designing and, and analyzing UMIs for deep amplicon sequencing. So first of all, as, as a lot of the talks this morning mentioned, uh, PCR amplification, amplification is bias prone for several reasons. Uh, basically, the, the input frequencies of the alleles in your input sample are not necessarily the same as the, input, the output frequencies after PCR. And this is due to several, several reasons. First, for example, it could be due to preferential amplification of short, uh, short fragments or preferential denaturation of, of sequences with low GC content or even just uh, stochastic sampling. And all these uh, different factors contribute to variability in the allele frequency. And so this is amplified also uh, by when you consider that many genomic studies require many, many rounds of PCR amplification. So standard studies require about 35 to 40 rounds of, of, of PCR. And even the most, uh, even the latest, uh, the latest developed uh, single cell RNA-seq uh, uh, studies or uh, protocols require at least 17 rounds of PCR. And so you can imagine that these sources of amplica amplication bias are uh, multiplied many times throughout your experiment. So how do we address these PCR duplicates? We obviously don't want these PCR duplicates in our libraries or in our analyses. And so in uh, random digestion libraries created, for example, using uh, sonication or some other fragmentation technique, uh, the, the PCR duplicates can be identified as reads that align to the same genomic location. For example, these two red reads right here. And uh, after PCR deduplication, you would simply remove one of these red reads. However, in uh, work we've been doing in our lab, we're particularly interested in deep amplicon sequencing, which is where we sequence the same genomic region uh, with 10,000, 100,000 reads. Uh, and so in this situation, every single read has the same start and stop location. And so it's impossible to deduplicate PCR, uh, duplicate, uh, PCR uh, products using this. And so uh, this is really the, the exact quantification of allele frequencies is really important for several uh, examples. For example, if you're trying to identify rare cancer mutations in your, in your population, it's really important to have a, a very accurate measure of the fraction of each allele. Or in, in our case, we're actually trying to determine the rate of off-targets uh, mutations after uh, genome editing experiments. And so the, the accurate identification and quantification of each allele is very important in this situation. And so it's kind of to address this, uh, the unique molecular identif identifiers, or UMIs, have been introduced to DNA, or added to DNA molecules before PCR amplification. And so in cases where the molecular sequence is the same, you can, uh, different UMIs can be used to distinguish molecules arising from different cells as opposed to those arising from PCR duplication or PCR duplication. And so on the bottom of uh, my slide here, I show that although these three sequences have the same genomic sequence, the UMI can be used to distinguish reads that are likely PCR duplicates versus unlikely PCR duplicates. So this has been used in uh, RNA-seq uh, uh, and where, where the DNA product must be heavily amplified using PCR. However, it's really important to, to quantify the, uh, e the present or the frequency of each read. And a recent study that was, it's in BioArchive right now, looked at actually the, the result of using UMIs in, in the changes in, in quantification, and they found that there were 119 transcripts for which the abundance was over or underestimated by greater than 1.25-fold uh, if you didn't use the UMI. And so it's really important for the quantification of, of these alleles in RNA-seq. However, we're looking at the harder problem, which is this amplicon sequencing, where uh, it's, it's really critical to have these UMI uh, because many sequences can have duplicated sequence, and this quantification of the allele proportions is critical. So with that background in mind, uh, I want to move on to this first question. How do I choose an optimal UMI length? Uh, and I'm going to introduce two metrics for uh, measuring the efficacy of uh, our UMI. The f and I want to first observe that in the example here, I show two cells uh, that have the same UMI 
uh, or the same amplicon sequence or the same sequence. And in the ideal situation, they would be paired with uh, different UMIs as shown on the, on the pool on the left. And so in this situation, we'd be able to determine that these two same sequence uh, uh, fragments were coming from different cells. However, uh, there is something called UMI collision. In this situation, it's uh, the unlikely occurrence that because perhaps your UMI pool is too small, uh, allele alleles with the same sequence from different cells were paired with the same UMI. And so basically, it's, uh, you're unable to distinguish. So you, would, you would basically call this as a UMI duplication event, and you would uh, you'd be unable to distinguish them as coming from different cells. And so we want to minimize the, minimize the UMI collision rate. The second uh, metric I'm going to talk about is allelic distortion. This is basically just saying how close is my initial or the true underlying allelic fraction compared to my post-deduplication uh, allele fraction or allelic frequency. So back to our question, how do I choose the optimal UMI length? Uh, in the current literature, I, I imagine that so people choose UMI lengths, uh, and I imagine the reviewers ask them, "How did you choose that reviewer, or how did you choose that UMI length?" And people are, people simply say, "Oh, the UMIs will far exceed the number of, of sequenced uh, of molecules in my experiment." And there's not really good rationale for choosing UMI length. And so we really wanted to uh, help experimentalists uh, choose the correct UMI length. And we note that if you choose either the too short or too long. Uh, UMIs are their impacts on your experimental outcomes. So first, if you have, if your UMI is too short, you could have low UMI diversity and resulting in many UMI collisions, and many uh, incorrect PCR deduplications events. If your UMI is too long, on the other hand, you waste sequence or cycles that are spent reading that UMI that you could, uh, that you could otherwise use on uh, informative reads uh, uh, data. And then, in addition, long UMIs can also interfere with primer sequence binding. For example, they could bind with complementary uh, sequence, or you could sterically hinder a proper adaptive function. In addition, you could accumulate more sequencing errors in your long UMIs, and this would be harder for your deduplication uh, step later in the process. So we define the probability of uh, UMI collision based on three things. First is the total number of unique UMIs, so how big is uh, your UMI, UMI pool? The second is the total number of DNA fragments, and then the third, the number of the UMI fragment pairs that were the UMI fragment pairs that were sequenced. And in this uh, in this study, to make things a little simpler for us, we have four assumptions. First of all, that the UMIs and the DNA fragments are sampled with replacement, basically saying that if we if we use up one UMI, there's still enough of the UMI so that the probability of choosing it the next time is is the same. Second, the UMIs appear in equal proportions, so this comes in our our, our trust in the synthesis process that whoever synthesized our UMIs, UMIs is hopefully going to create an even distribution of UMIs uh, and we're not going to have just uh, an overabundance of one or two of them. Uh, third is independence in UMI DNA fragment pairing, basically saying that each individual fragment will pair with a UMI with equal probability. And then finally, that the number of sequence reads is less than the number of, of UMIs. So with these caveats, we're going to move in uh, first to a simulated population where we're going to have an allelic fraction or a, a population in which our allelic fractions are, uh, as shown in this, this bar plot here, the purple population is 10% uh, and the green population is also 10%. And the blue population represents 30% of the alleles and then the red population is 50% of the alleles. So here we have a, a, a sample with four separate alleles. Uh, with, with defined uh, for frequencies in the population. And then we're going to simulate samples with uh, 100,000 reads, and then we're going to vary the length of UMIs between 1 and 18 base pairs. And then finally, we, dupl we deduplicate the reads with the same UMI in sequence, and then measure the allele fractions. So what we get is something that looks like this, where on the left of the plot here, uh, on the x-axis, we have the UMI length, ranging from short UMIs on the left, uh, with one base pair on the left, uh, to long uh, base, long UMIs of 18 base pairs on the right. On the right, we have our true allelic, uh, pro, allelic fractions on, on the right. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the allelic fraction after deduplication. And so here we can see that if you have too short of a UMI, you actually distort your allelic fraction significantly. And then as the UMI length increases, you're, uh, the, you approach the truth of the allelic frequency. And so we wanted to quantify this. Okay, how many of these? Uh, how how frequently? How frequent are our UMI collisions? And so this is just a plot where on the y-axis is shown the the collision rate in our sample, and on the x-axis is shown the UMI length. Here we can see that the collision rate drops drastically as you increase your UMI length. The surprising thing is, looking at this plot, even if you look at something with uh, like a 12 base pair UMI, which is pretty long, uh, you still have a, about a one in a thousand chance of having a UMI collision in your sample. Uh, 
biologists may not be concerned about having the, this very, very low rate. And so we, uh, uh, but, but we, we think this is still interesting that you have to have basically a 17 base pair uh, UMI uh, with 100,000 reads to, to have no UMI collisions. And so we wanted to kind of define this mathematically or, or investigate this mathematically. And so we've, def we've uh, come up with a vector notation for describing UMI allele pairings. And so here we have, here's our vector here, and here's our first allele, and here's our second allele. And then here we have just three different UMIs. And at each position in the vector, we have, uh, it's represented by the number of times this allele was paired with this UMI here. And so here you can see that uh, allele one was present twice in our population. It was paired with UMI one once and UMI three once. And then allele two was paired with UMI one once as well. The sum of the, uh, the components of the vector are the number of sequenced reads. So here we're sequencing three reads. And the uh, UMI pairings that represent UMI collisions will have uh, at least one entry with greater than one here. So for example here, here we see that allele was paired with UMI1 twice, meaning that we cannot distinguish two different uh, alleles coming from different cells because they were paired with the same UMI. Uh, so we can determine the pro we can calculate the probability of each individual uh, UMI allele pairing using multinomial. So if you imagine this, this is a situation in which you have two urns, one is your urn full of UMIs and one is your urn full of alleles, and you randomly pick out uh, a UMI and, a, and a, an allele, that's what that's the probability of this particular configuration. And then we can uh, compute this probability across all configurations. And this little line in my slide is, of course, the hardest part mathematically is determining which arrangements have no collisions. And if you're interested in that, you can look at our paper, but it's a pretty interesting problem. And then basically, the probability of no UMI collisions is the sum of these arrangements with no collisions. So uh, we can, this, that produces this really nice plot here where on the y-axis we have the probability of having no collisions where uh, a higher number of means, uh, a higher uh, uh, lines show no collisions. And the y-axis is our sample size here, so you can see as, it, as you increase the sample size, you require a longer UMI to have uh, no collisions. And here we see that at 100,000 100, reads, you, uh, even if you have a 15 base pair uh, barcode, you're going to have uh, some, at least one collision in your sample. And so we, uh, we were talking with biologists, and they were like, okay, we can maybe tolerate a, f a small number of, uh, of collisions, but what we really care about is how, how, does, this, how does it affect my uh, allele frequency? How does it affect uh, my experimental outcome? And so uh, for this, we return to this, uh, this plot here, and here I've added two things. So first of all, here is our model prediction. We were really excited to see that uh, our model prediction exactly correlates with our simulated samples. Uh, and then what we're going to, to measure is how much do the allele frequencies on the left uh, differ from our true allele uh, frequencies. And so we define this uh, measure called the total allelic fraction distortion. Uh, we first define the allele fraction distortion, which is defined as the difference between the true allele proportion and the observed allelic proportion. Here we have our Ms that represent the, the true allelic proportion. This is our, our computed observed or predicted observed allelic proportion. And then the total allelic fraction distortion is simply the sum of the allelic fraction, allelic fraction distortion for all alleles, where if you have high allelic fraction distortion, it uh, it's, means you're distorted. And if you low, have low total allelic fraction distortion, distorted, that means you're, you're estimating the allelic fraction fairly accurately. And so in this plot here, I've added the total allelic fraction distortion here. So we have, with short UMIs, uh, you have high allelic fraction distortion. And as, as with longer UMIs, you can have a shorter, or you have a smaller total allelic fraction distortion. And this is for the example, again, where we have four different alleles. But what about the case where you have fewer number of alleles? For example, only two alleles, where you're trying to detect, for example, a rare uh, cancer allele. And so here, uh, I'm just showing two alleles. The blue alleles is present in your population with 1% frequency. And the, the majority allele is present, or the major allele is present in 99% uh, frequency. And here you can see, in this situation, uh, even if, if I have too short of alleles, uh, my allelic fraction distortion is huge. Basically, if I have uh, a very short allele, I, I, gro I grossly overestimate the frequency of my rare allele. And so if you're, if you're asking yourself, okay, if I choose poorly my U and my length, uh, you're going to overestimate your rare alleles and underestimate your frequent alleles. And so this is all very uh, interesting to us. Uh, 
and we have uh, we have kind of put all the, of our findings, both in the both in estimating the total allelic fraction distortion, as well as in uh, estimating the number of uh, allele collisions or of uh, UMI collisions, into the software package uh, called UMPUMI, which is uh, accessible at this address on GitHub. If you just Google AmpUMI, there's one YouTuber with this uh, handle. But other than that, you can uh, find our GitHub page and our manuscript. Uh, basically, there's uh, so basically, AmpUMI is this end-to-end -end toolkit where it's aiding in your UMI design. So if you have bio or experimentalists asking you how long should my UMI be for this amplicon, amplicon sequencing experiment, you can use AMP UMI. As well as after your amplicon sequencing, you can. Uh, you can use it to process, uh, you can do quality control on your UMIs, you can trim your reads from the UMIs and do error correction and deduplication. There's basically three main commands, which the first of which is UMI collision, which answers the question, what is the probability of observing no UMI collisions given this UMI length, the number of sequenced reads, and the proportion of alleles? The second command is UMI distortion, which uh, if you're less interested in maybe the number of collisions, but mostly interested in how will this uh, UMI length affect my allelic uh, fraction, uh, you can use this amp UMI distortion to calculate that. And then, of course, you can do these backwards. So you can ask, given an upper bound on my distortion or a lower bound on my number of collisions, what is the minimum UMI length that I need to, to, mean to, to satisfy that bound? And then, uh, lastly, is UMI process, which is used to remove PCR duplicates from a, a sequence sample. And so uh, this is, uh, we've used this on uh, several amp deep amplicon sequencing uh, sequences with uh, great success, and uh, hope, hopefully it's easy for you and your and your uh, and others to use as well. So, just in conclusion, uh, talked about how unique molecular identifiers, these UMIs, are critical for removing PCR amplification bias, particularly in deep amplicon sequencing experiments. Uh, second, how choosing the correct UMI length is necessary for successful experimental interpretation. Uh, how UMI collisions can lead to inaccurate allelic frequency measurements, particularly that having too short UMI can overestimate the frequency of rare alleles in your population. And then finally, how AMP UMI, which is the software we've developed, can enable proper design and analysis of UMIs in amplicon sequencing experiments. Here I just have a link to our uh, GitHub page, as well as uh, my Twitter handle if you'd like to contact me. With that, I'd like to uh, thank all those people who contributed to this project. Uh, again, my advisor, Luca Pinello, and particularly uh, Rick Ferroni, who uh, was a collaborator and uh, co-author on this project. The other people in the uh, Pinello lab, as well as Daniel Bauer, who's been providing our experimental data. With that, I'll flip back to our, my similar slide and take any questions. That's right. So in the design phase, this you would simply simply take the sum of the the UMI lengths, mm -hmm. and, and that would be the input for this program. Uh, in the in the analysis step, uh, the it is possible to chop UMIs off of both lanes, uh, both both ends. So yes. Uh, hi, thank you very much for for our presentations. I'm from the Summer Fisher Scientific, and we just uh, launched the uh, recent product with the UMI to do the liquid biopsies. And we have, uh, you no, know, when we do the design, we have struggling with the uh, UMI lines. So my question is, when you're considered for the UMI lines, have you considered these uh, uh, UMI collisions uh, <laughs> interacted by the sequencing arrows? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's something we, I mean, that's definitely a drawback from the long UMI. You're going to have more sequencing errors. Yes. Uh, there's error correction you can do, so there's, uh, there's a bunch of UMI deduplifiers that will will take. But actually, account. that's the the difficult part is you the UMI cover the the all the diversities of the sequence, so it's hard to identify is a sequencing error or is a true um, diversity region in your in your UMI. Yeah, yeah. It, we assume that because your UMI pool should be pretty large, okay. uh, the 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 sequencing errors should contribute significantly to that, significantly to this. And actually, there was a uh, recent publication that showed that the UMI error, even if you correct for UMI, or even if you correct for sequencing errors in the UMI, doesn't actually contribute significantly to the outcome of deduplication. So. Thank you again.
repertoire sequencing data. 